How's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 187, and I sat down with Holden Amory. He was in uh, Florida, as he still is, and I was in Nashville, which I'm not now. (laughs) And we chatted about a truly horrific moment in Holden's life. He was driving down the highway in Florida in Boca Raton and a piece of road debris, 20 pound metal chunk came off of a vehicle and came through his windshield and nearly sliced his face in half. And as you can imagine, the recovery from that, the fact that he even survived that is insanely miraculous. And his recovery from that and his outlook and everything uh, was what made me want to talk with him. I saw a video about him. It was a news report on Facebook making the rounds. It was a video about him and the accident. And I thought, ooh, I got to talk to this guy. He was 22 when it happened. And it's such an impressionable time. I suppose for a traumatic event like this, any age would be an impressionable one. Uh, but I really enjoyed talking with Holden. He's a he's an interesting, interesting guy. There is a picture of him. So he has pictures on his Facebook, which I'll put links to all that stuff on heyhumanpodcast.com like I always do. But there are images of him from the accident on his Facebook wall. And uh, so there is a very graphic image on the poster art for this episode. And just warning you that uh, that, that is the case if you go looking Um, that's what you're going to find. So uh, when you get your face almost sliced in half, it's pretty graphic. And my friend, my dear best friend, Ellen, who is a godsend in my life, and uh, really, I fill out the stuff on the poster art, and then she makes it look good because she's awesome like that. Um, Anyway, she's like, my God, this picture is horrifying. And I'm sure other people will think it's horrifying too, because it is. And but it's it's what he looked like. And I have a, a what he looks like now, and then from the accident. So just just a fair warning. Um, I think I traumatized Ellen. I apologize, Ellen. I don't want to traumatize everybody else. I did ask Holden if it was okay to use those images, and he said yes. So I, I mean, I figured he was going to say yes anyway because of the pictures on his Facebook. But it's always good to ask. Okay, usual stuff. Hey Human Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Pretty easy to find. Susan Ruthism, if you want to know about me personally, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can email me, Susan at Hey Human Podcast. If you want to find out about other things I'm doing in life, my artwork and other projects and such, go to SusanRuth.com. If you wish to support Hey Human, you can do so by hitting the donate button at HeyHumanPodcast.com. And on that website is also the links page, which I curate every week for every episode. So lots of information there. Uh, What else? Oh, I've got some big news coming for 2020. Not going to give it away yet. Don't you love it when people do that? Um, I've got I'm announcing I've got big news that I'm going to be announcing. (laughs) But it's true. So working on some stuff I'm excited about and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. And I think that's about it. Uh, Holden did talk about there are phone numbers to call Every state has an individual number. It's the Highway Patrol, where you can let them know if there's road debris on the highway as you're going by. And we do talk about 911, but everything I looked up, and we talked about this as well in the episode, 911 does have its hands full. So uh, having that Highway Patrol number handy in your phone, pre-programmed, is a great idea. If you see any kind of debris, tires, ladders, chunks of metal, any whatever it is, definitely uh, call that number uh, and you might save a life. Okay, let's do this. Thanks for listening, everybody. Oh, I almost forgot. Please rate and review Hey Human on iTunes. Thought I was going to get by without that one, but there it is. All right, here we go. Holden Amory, thank you for being on Hey Human Podcast. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and you are hailing over the uh, interwebs from Florida somewhere. Where are you? You got it. Yeah, South uh, South Florida in Delray Beach. So uh, mm. right next to Boca Raton. Nice, a beach town. Yeah, right on the water. Oh, jealous. That's awesome. I'm landlocked here in Nashville, so. 
I was just there at the uh, the end of May, I want to say. If only I had known about you sooner, we could have done this in person. Uh, yeah, no, it's a really cool town. Uh, I'd never been before. And, yeah, uh, the ro- roads kind of suck, but besides that, it's oh, <laughs> yeah, it's the bane of our existence here. It's yeah. forty. It's full of holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I couldn't believe the potholes like, no, everywhere. It's crazy. It's crazy. Try to, I think the first time I learned about you was on Facebook, actually, um, on one of those videos that goes around that talks about crazy stories. And, right on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got, I have a pretty crazy story, yeah. You really do. <laughs> and, uh, and that intrigued me. But what intrigued me even further was the fact that you took what had happened and turned it into something really lovely um so let's just start from the beginning take us back uh, april 29th 2016 yeah you got it so um i was 22 i just turned 22 at the beginning of april um and i just finished recording what i thought was going to be my breakout album and everything just bright eyed bright bushy eyed young kid and i'd actually come back down to south florida from vermont to kind of promote it and um lend some of my music gear to a friend uh he actually produced the album up in vermont Uh, but i was lending him some gear in miami for a wedding gig that he was playing and so uh on the morning of april 29th i was up at off off of forest hill boulevard and exit 66 and um it was just my younger brother and i uh, and i I was heading out the door and I had all my stuff with me and I was I kind of turned around and I was like, do you want to come to this wedding gig by any chance? Like, you know, it could be fun, like Miami, like all of this. And he's like, no, I don't really want to. And I say kind of like half jokingly, like it might be the last time you see me, um, just, you know, trying to be funny and everything. And I took off down the road and about uh, 30 minutes into my trip, um, I was in the far left lane. I thought I was supposed to be exiting way earlier than I um, than I was, and so I uh, I changed lanes all the way to the far right. Um, I was listening to "Peaceful Easy Feeling" by the Eagles, still one of my favorite songs and bands. And uh, so yeah, I was in the far right lane. I looked at my GPS. I realized I wasn't supposed to be there, and I was literally about to start merging back to the left to get in the uh, HOV lane. And um, there was an 18 wheeler um, into the, uh, in the lane to the left of me and a little bit further ahead and a Cadillac following pretty closely behind. And the 18 wheeler kicked up the 20 pound piece of metal that was later identified as a brake drum. Um, and it ricocheted off of the person's headlight following too closely behind, which sent the trajectory, a trajectory at an angle through my lane and it came uh, through my windshield. I was driving probably 80 miles an hour um, I somehow was able to flinch. I took both of my hands off of the steering wheel. Uh, the piece of metal actually bounced off my steering wheel, and if I lift my hands there, it would have completely cut off the, uh, the fingers on my right hand. So I somehow, if I flinch, it hits me in the face, it bounces off my shoulder and shoots out the back of my car. I somehow am able to put my hands back on the steering wheel and bring the car to a full stop. I don't put it in park or anything. I just put my foot firmly on the brake. And I really remember pushing with like all as hard as I could on that brake to keep the car from not moving. Um, I remember the G-forces uh, of slowing down. I remember like lurching forward as I'm like stopping because I'm stopping from 80 to a full stop really quickly. Uh, I remember trying to look in my uh, rear view mirror to see what had happened and I couldn't see anything. So I remember trying to touch my face and I remember feeling blood and thinking that was gross because I hate blood. <laughs> and so I just put my head back and I just grabbed onto my leg and I just I kind of just was looking up into like the sun and the clouds and people started pulling over and um, trying to comfort me and they they all said after the fact that I actually was the one comforting them because my injuries were so bad that they were really terrified but because of how calm that I was during the whole thing that they made them think that it was okay. Uh, you know, I lost about 40% of my blood at the scene. Um, yeah, I'm all over the place with this. No, and uh, yeah, no. It's, it's, um, you know, the only reason they didn't airlift me out that day was because I was fully responsive somehow. Um, you know, they they asked me for my name and my mom's name and her phone number, and I gave it to them immediately. Um, I told them that I was deathly allergic to peanuts, which I am. But why that's important in a medical emergency on the side of the road, beyond me. But uh, you know, and. Um, 
yeah, I somehow I, I got out of the car myself when I got into the ambulance. Um, I asked them if I could blow my nose, and I told them my jaw hurt, and they're like, please, whatever you do, don't blow your nose. I didn't have a nose at that point. Um, I know you can see the scar, but it, um, it kind of like, like pretty much the exact midsection of my face was just kind of hanging off. They slice um, through your face. So you, at this point, your adrenaline is going so much. It was so crazy. And they actually, uh, I didn't, they didn't, they had to knock me out at the hospital. I didn't go, I didn't get knocked out or anything like that. I stayed fully awake until I got there. And uh, yeah, you know, people were pulling over. They were taking pictures of me on the side of the road. Uh, so I have a, pre a couple pretty funny pictures of me on the side of the road from that day. Um, people were trying to put towels in my face to kind of stop the bleeding. Um, I've actually reached out to a few of the people who are uh, from that day. And I'm actually still family friends with one of the uh, women named Tarshika Barton. Uh, she had her son in the car with her. And uh, his name's Daryl. He's adorable. He's, I think, maybe three or four. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, the first surgery... Um, was just to kind of save my life. You know, they called my mom up in Vermont, um, and she had no idea what was going on. They just said, your son is in the hospital. She wasn't sure which one it was, because I have a younger brother named Stedman, as I said earlier. And, uh, she, you know, she was absolutely terrified. She flew down the next day. Um, my dad uh, was in Texas, and my dad drove overnight. And he was actually the first thing I woke up to, or the first thing I remember in the hospital. Uh, my brother had come to check on me while I was um, while I was out and everything. But I, and I had, I guess I had like gauze wrapped around my whole midsection. You couldn't even see if it was me, and it was really swollen. Um, but so I remember my dad walked into the hospital, like into my room, and I remember thinking to myself, like, what are you doing here? This is so strange. Like, dad, like what? Like we weren't really on good terms either up until that point. Um, and then I kind of looked down and I saw that I was the one in the hospital bed and I had all these IVs and wires coming out of me. I was like, what am I doing here? And he takes a picture of me and he immediately shows me. He's like, well, you got in a really bad accident. This is you. And he, I think he was in shock about the whole thing. And um, his reaction was pretty mild. And so for me, it was kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. I got hit in the face. I broke, you know, when I was in high school and when I was younger, I broke maybe a dozen bones or something, you know. Um, so it just felt like another sports injury almost. I would say you're either a, were a child stuntman or <laughs> you yeah, played no, I was, So when I was, I, I can totally get to, get to how I came into music and everything. Um, but he was a... Uh, so it just felt like another injury for me and my brother was there and I actually, so from when I had my head back and everything and my nose got pulverized, I ended up swollen, I swallowing a lot of like the, uh, the cartilage and bone that was in my face. And so my dad held the bucket for me while I was puking up my nose and everything that next day. But, uh, my whole family ended up coming into the hospital room and they they did a good job not being like visibly sad but you still knew that they were upset because it's a big ordeal and I can't I, like, I remember thinking that it wasn't fair that they were more upset about it than I was like I felt like that they had to match the level of like it, it would happen to me like you should at least match my level of upsetness and where and were so, you at on a scale from 1 to 10 you were from, high probably on morphine or yeah, or I was, yeah like Dilaudid like yeah. I think it's like, $30,000 worth of pharmaceuticals in the three days I was there or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. The original. Um, but yeah, no, I was happy-go-lucky. I was really just, like, I just kept thinking to myself, like, I can wiggle my toes. I can think straight for the most part. Uh, like, currently, you know, I can I can touch my finger. Like, I can feel, like, I have feeling everywhere. Like, I'm, I'm alive. I was like, I couldn't understand for the life of me what they were so upset about. I was like, who cares if I have a, like a scar on my face? But I guess back then, it was a little bit scarier because there was no bone in the right side of my face and I had to rebuild it with titanium. But I don't know. It was just so strange. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend why they'd be more upset than I was. 
Now do you understand why? <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit still, but I I still don't think it's fair to uh, to be more upset than the person. Then, like, it's like if, they, if they don't care, then why should you care, you know? Like, if they, if they don't mind, then you shouldn't mind, really. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's their cross to bear and everything like that. Yeah, I, emotions are funny that way, though. People respond to things differently based on they're bringing whatever they have to the table, right? Totally. So, yeah. And, and if they love the person, it's probably traumatic just to see them hurting and, you know, whatever oh, else. Yeah, exactly. No, you're totally right. And that's why from the very get-go, I made it my mission to show my family that I didn't care, that yeah. I was completely fine. I started making jokes. I can't tell you how many videos I have of me saying dumb things or like taking stupid selfies with like giant trumpets hanging out my nose because like they had to keep it open or whatever, you know? I just, I, I made it my mission from the very first day to show my family that I was okay so that they could also be okay. And so I just made jokes and I had fun with it and I just embraced it as much as I could. Oh. And was that always um, your personality or was that something yeah, that you know I think so and I didn't mean to cut you off like no, that but I, just okay. think, I think it's a great question um, and I've had conversations with my mother about it too um, I would credit her I think with a lot of my resilience and everything as well and how I'm able to bounce back um, you know she uh, my parents split up when I was about seven years old and we went from living in this beautiful I don't know 3,500 square foot house or so to my mom my little brother brother and I moving to Vermont and into her sister's basement (laughs) like in the span of like two weeks and so for us um, it was really strange at first and she told us that we were living in a hobbit hole and for a little seven-year-old me that made sense I was like oh yeah whatever I don't need a big house I got a hobbit hole like it was funny so it's just like I think like little lessons like that throughout my life and with her and everything and just like watching her work so hard to succeed for my younger brother and I um I think that's that's where I got it Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. I don't know I've always been just a happy guy as well yeah and I, I, I've, I've always been pretty good at like not letting things affect me in a negative way because I think a lot of the time negative energy is an absolute waste of time I hate dwelling on things and being upset you know like I tried after my accident honestly people were telling me like you had people come up to you and be like you know if I was you like I'd kill myself like you're doing such a good job which is like it sounds cool and sweet on the surface but when you kind of delve into it a little bit more it's pretty ignorant to say yeah but you know um, but people kept telling me that like because like, I literally I never went through like a real period of mourning about it I just like I was so excited in so many different ways about it honestly because like I felt like I had this really cool story to tell now that like was really unique to myself and like I've always felt like I was different but now I feel super different um, but I, I remember for like a period of a week or so I tried to make myself mad about it it was, the, it, was, it was the dumbest thing. I hated it. It huh. was like a week of like trying to like to like bring up these like emotions that people were telling me that I was like like pushing to like the wayside and everything. And I explored it, and it just it still wasn't worth it. I, was like, I don't know. It's like I'm still here, you yeah. know. Like we're having a conversation, like. I have nothing to be upset about. I've got no pain, you know, like most of the nerve endings in the right side of my face are severed, so I can't really feel anything, but like, I think that's a godsend. <laughs> totally. Also, I don't know. It's just so many things went right for me. It's really hard to be upset. How long uh, were you in the hospital? Um, I think the first, I wanted to get out as fast as I could. Um, both, uh, I've been in three times. I think the first one was four days. I think the second one was three days. And then the last one was just one night. And how many surgeries? Uh, three. So there was the one, the uh, the initial one that saved my life. Um, they basically just sewed me shut. They just, uh, they left everything that was in there, whatever. Um, like if you had seen pictures of me from the time, like my cheekbone, my right cheekbone was pushed all the way to my ear. So if you looked at me from behind, you'd see like, a bump sticking out by like three inches. Um, the second surgery, which is about 10 days after, that one was to kind of just like rebuild my face a little bit. 
Um, it was the first like real reconstructive surgery. So, um, but Dr. King was his name. He's a really good looking dude. Like, just like one of those movie doctors, honestly, like TV show doctors. Um, he was telling me that they had to like vacuum out the bones from the midsection of my face because it resembled uh, crumpled potato chips. And uh, he said that they were actually kind of scared or worried at first. Um, because they weren't sure where to start um, putting in the titanium because there was no bone to attach it to. So what they ended up doing was uh, they attached a bracket to my eyebrow and from the bracket they kind of just kept attaching the pieces until they made their way down my face. And luckily they came out pretty pretty symmetrical, like they did a really great job. But um, there's a metal wire and then mesh and then uh, brackets on either side of my nose. I think another one right here. Um, oh yeah, you, they can't see it. But yeah, that's good <laughs> but to yeah, describe it. Yeah, it's, uh, and then uh, I've got screws that come out of my gums above my canines on both sides. Did you lose teeth? Uh, that was another one of those things that went really well for me. Um, so when I got hit, my uh, my jaw was broken on both sides, and so it pitched forward, and it shattered my two front teeth and a few of my molars. And my two front teeth are like sticking out in like two different ways, like crazy, they are broken in half. And the uh, doctors were telling me I was gonna need to get braces again to correct my bite, and that the teeth were gonna die, and they're gonna have to pull them out, and then put in flappers, and then fake teeth. Um, but over the course of like three months from after the accident, or the teeth shifted back into place somehow. They turned from black back to kind of white, yeah. and then they just all they had to do was put like the like the rosin on it or whatever to just make them look like teeth again. And so yeah, they're like half my like the my two front teeth were the ones that took the bulk of the damage, but they're like completely fine now. Wow, you're like some crazy regenerative super. It's, it's insane. I maybe I don't like. I have no idea. You know, another one too was my eyelid. They uh, they didn't think I was gonna have control of my eyelid anymore, and they're gonna have to put a gold nugget in it to weigh it down because uh, they didn't want me to go blind from my eye drying out. But once the swelling went back down, my eye function works completely normal again. I've still got really good vision. Did you lose your occipital bone? Is that like that's this the right eye, here. eye socket? The yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, it was pretty. That's so like you can, if, if you could feel it or see it, there's uh, there's like bolts and everything that kind of jut out, and you can feel them all with your fingers as you go around like the orbital. Uh -huh. Yeah. Interesting. You look. I, you would never know, honestly. I mean, I know I'm yeah. not seeing you in person, but just from the visual of the video here. It's extraordinary. It's hard. It's yeah, it's hard to tell. Extraordinary surgeons, for sure. Yeah, it, bum it bums me out a little bit, you know? Like, I feel like I earned it, and now it's almost gone, you know? <laughs> I'll play I, I, like, I'll play a lot of music and everything, and um, like, I'll, I'll, like, I'll play at an open mic or something, and I'll kind of tell my story, and everyone will come up to me like, I would have had no idea. Like, you look so good. Like, you can't, you can't even see the scar. It's, like, completely faded. I'm just like, dang. <laughs> like, I, like I like the scar I like, I yeah you can see a little bit it looks off. like a little birthmark or something uh, yeah it's like what if, if I go out in the sun enough like it gets pretty pink yeah sure. red or pink yeah yeah so now so you are in Florida so that's an inevitability oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> do you remember uh and, and really between the being in the hospital and stuff did you have any moments of um you know, I always like to ask people this when they're in a life and death situation. Did anything appear? Or did you see anything? Did you have any really deep thoughts that you didn't already have or anything like that? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, there's always the classic, like, I don't take like the little things for granted anymore. You know, like, I kind of pay attention to everything, like the bigger things that you always end up borrowing trouble about. I'm, I'm more quickly to let roll off my back. But I'd say one of the weirder things, or maybe one of the better things to come out of it, um, I'd say I'm more spiritual and faithful now than I was prior. Um, when I got in the accident, so when I got hit, one of the thing, one of the earliest things I really remember was everything turned green for me. Everything was green, and it kind of seemed like puffs of smoke were coming um, out of the corners of my vision and kind of just swirling there. 
and um, I remember looking into it later on, and um, it says, uh, and it was saying that uh, that green represents the archangel Raphael, who was uh, the angel of prosperity and healing. And that if you see the color green when you're in a traumatic situation like that, then he's come to basically bless you and make you walk away without any injury. Wow. And so, you know, I walked away from this thing. I literally walked out of my car. The only thing wrong with my face is a scar and it's full of titanium. There's nothing else wrong with me. So there's that part. And Islam, apparently, he's the angel of music, which is a huge like part of my life and everything like that. Um, and so it seemed kind of weird and I ended up looking into some of the other archangels and none of them none of the other ones seemed to kind of fit the situation that had just happened was other ones were about like bravery and like integrity and whatever and bravery maybe but like I was thinking more along the lines of healing um, and so that just it made me a little like research a little bit more um, about like religion I guess and Christianity and just the uh, everything and uh, I don't know I started reading the Bible and everything trying to get right with uh, with God so <laughs> where are you with yeah. that now I mean um, I, it seems to me that pre-Bible if you had never read it and you know an archangel comes to you then you don't necessarily need to read the Bible <laughs> you're already yeah, on right? their good like, list maybe not like maybe I'm pretty like in good standing or whatever he's like yeah you're not doing it bad like <laughs> You're doing a good job, yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I just uh, I just finished uh, Genesis in the Bible. It was uh, it's interesting. You know, it's um, I find it really, really, really interesting. Um, and I feel like I should at least read it one time in my life. Sure, it's you a know? great it's a great book to read, regardless of whether you take it as fiction or nonfiction. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. It's a bestseller for a reason, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I'd say that, I'd say that'd probably be like the. Um, one of the bigger things to come out of it. I think it's given my life a whole new direction. Um, like before it was, uh, like, I don't know, like before I thought I could, I thought I could break into the, the music world and kind of do that whole thing. And I think I was more ignorant to what the music world was. And now I think I have a better shot. Um, How do and, you mean? Uh, yeah. Explain what you mean by that. Oh, uh, well, they, you know, they always say that you need to have some sort of gimmick. You know, like, you can't just be super talented. Being super talented isn't a gimmick. I'm not super talented. Wow, that's um, super depressing to think that yeah. being really, really talented isn't enough to get no, you somewhere. No, it's not. It's, it's, like, it's the most tragic thing. It's such a business that you can be amazing, but if you don't have the right pull or, like, the right story or the right anything, then it just isn't going to happen, unfortunately. Or, like, the money, even. And sometimes it costs a lot of money as well. It definitely costs money. Yeah, and so... Um, I think that I can kind of use my face as a, and my story as a calling card in a sense like hey this is what happened to me and I'm still here um, if you could listen to my music that'd be great <laughs> no. yeah I so, think those TV music shows love stories like that yeah you know and like I don't know if I'd ever do The Voice or American Idol because I think they kind of like they're just trying to make money off of your story in that sense and well, I mean, like, to be true, the music, that is the music industry. It's just trying to make money off of you. <laughs> oh, totally. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. But, like, I don't know. The way, I feel like the way that they do it, uh, I'm just not a fan of the way that they tell the stories and that the way that they're uh, used in that sense because a lot of the time those artists don't even go anywhere by a lot of the time. I mean, like, 99% of the time. Yeah. And they just got used. I don't yeah. know. I don't want to get used. I want to totally be understand. here for good. Yeah, I absolutely understand. It's crazy to think that if you had been, say, texting and looking down, it would have yeah. gone right through your brain. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a great point that you uh, that you bring up too. You know, I I went through a lot of what ifs. Like, what if I left earlier? What if I left like two minutes later? What if I drove half a mile an hour slower? What if I was an inch to the left or the inch to the right? What if I was checking my phone? What if I never transferred over the lanes? What if I had a better idea of where I was going? There's a million, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there's a million of what ifs, um, and I learned that you're not really. It's not really worth dwelling on. Like I said earlier, it's not really worth dwelling on those what ifs because they'll drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm, I'd rather be happy for what I have right now in this moment than 
what could have gone differently in the past. Yeah, because it didn't happen, so what's the point? Uh, yeah, or you know, maybe like, it happened is, in an alternate reality or something. Yeah, <laughs> maybe in one of the other multiverses that we've got going on here and everything. Yeah. So, and it's funny that it's not funny because it's not funny. Uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me after the accident from around the country who said that they heard my story, and some people even saying that they went through something similar. Um, and I, I believe it was in Northern California, but an aunt, I believe, and her nephew were driving to Thanksgiving dinner. And um, I believe it was a brake drum as well, the same piece of metal that hit me, came through the windshield and he was looking down at his phone, texting. And I believe it struck him in the neck or like the jugular. And she, in a moment of panic, drove him to the nearest hospital. And unfortunately, the hospital didn't have a trauma center. So then they had to airlift him out of the hospital to a trauma center a few miles away. But he unfortunately didn't make it. Um, and so, I don't know, hearing a lot of stories like that really put um, my life into perspective and really just how lucky I got to be able to survive and then be okay. But having so many people reach out to me and like, tell me, like, ask me how I was doing this and how I was remaining so calm about everything, um, and all these people reaching out to me, telling me that they experienced similar things, I felt like I needed to do something about it, um, even if it was minor and everything, even if I can show like one person that life's whatever you make it, you know, then it's worth it, and. I really believe that one can be a lot. I do believe that. Yeah. You know, like, That's if, their, if their life is better because of, because of it, then, like, I'm glad that I could help or whatever. You know, it's, I don't know, I just want to, I, I think that everyone should have a 20 pound in the face moment. You know, Even if it's metaphorical. I, yeah, metaphorical. <laughs> Hopefully like that, metaphorical. They, yeah, please. I also tell them they should work in a kitchen at some point. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, that is, yeah. you know, that is a very humbling experience. I've done that, yeah. and it's very humbling, for sure. Yeah, it makes you respect, it makes you respect, like, the cooks and the waiters and everything a little bit more, yeah. too, the waitresses. It's hard work, for sure. I think at AAA, it said that there was 30,000 incidents of debris injuring folks. Oh man, you're calling me out on the facts and everything, the statistics right now. Um, well, I read sounds... it just about an hour ago, so don't feel <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, no, that's about right. Um, you know, it's uh, South Florida is one of the most dangerous places to drive uh, on I-95 in the country. Yeah, it it, uh, it affects people pretty far and wide. And I, any anyone who's listening today, um, I implore you to look up your local state's highway patrol for South Florida and Florida in general. It's Star Three. 47 or star FHP and if you call them they'll send out a road ranger to pick up a piece of debris that's in the middle of the road it could be tire shreds it could be a ladder it could be a shovel um that's that's hugely important I think it is and um I'll I'll put links for for people on heyhumanpodcast.com so they can find their local yeah and uh, I mean honestly I don't think I've ever met anyone who has not had whether it's as small as a pebble coming to their windshield or um, having to dodge and or get hit by tires coming off of semis because they yeah. have the retreads to actual equipment. I mean, it's insane. It's dangerous. It's totally wild. You know, and I never even really thought about it before before the uh, before it happened and everything. And it's it's incredible like the whole new world that was opened up to me once it did happen you know, I grew up in Vermont for the most part which is uh, a really small state it's really clean you know for the most part the roads are pretty well kept a lot of them are dirt roads so um so I, I you know I've had pebbles bounce off my windshield but like I never really thought of like trash or like something else getting kicked up out of the roadway you know like especially a 20 pound piece of metal like I would have, I don't know if I would have believed that was possible I guess like yeah no, I, you kind of just think that someone else always takes care of it like oh mm -hmm. like there's not road 
going to be trash in the road because someone's there to pick it up and a lot of the time there's not someone there and you have to be that phone call you have to be the one to make the phone call to get rid of it yeah and a lot of the time people don't like they just don't even know um you know i had this one young woman who reached out to me after my accident um she had a young son and uh she was driving in northern florida and a boat uh, dropped a fishing let out the back of its like, out of it. It was hauling a boat, and a boat dropped a fishing let. And she thought it was a Coca Cola can because she was falling behind it. She just thought like trash fell out. It was this little red, Coca Cola size, whatever, like lead weight. And it just crumpled her windshield, bounced off, like missed her, bounced off the ceiling of her car, went over her baby's head. The baby's completely fine. She was completely fine. She pulled over. But she, uh, you know, she reached out to me afterwards and we had a dialogue about what happened and everything like that. And uh, a few months later, uh, she actually texted me and never text and drive folks bad but she was on i-95 and she texted me to say that she saw a shovel in the middle of the road and she wasn't sure who to call and she was asking who to call um and you can call 911 they'll patch you over to uh the highway patrol usually uh but i was in that instant though i was baffled that she didn't know who to call because she'd already been through this accident and so it made me think, like, if you've already gone through something like this and you still don't know the number to call, then the average person is going to have absolutely no idea that they can do something. Right. About it. And in that, I should say that try and reserve 911 for things that are actual emergencies, but definitely uh, to know what your highway patrol number is. And I, would, I would consider that an emergency. Yeah, I, I guess you would, yeah. <laughs> if, you, yeah if, you've well, got, just, if you've got a ladder that's about to cause a pileup on I 95, I right. 100% consider that. Yeah. It, but I'm just saying it'd probably be faster to call directly to the highway patrol that's going to deal with oh, it. Oh, totally. Yeah. So it depends it depends on the state. I will say with Florida Highway Patrol, I don't know if they're understaffed or something, but sometimes you'll be on hold for like four minutes. Yeah. On 911? On Highway Patrol. So if you, yeah. <laughs> you're, on, um, you're on hold on 911. You're like, well, he's murdering me right now. Yeah, right. That'd be the but worst. But I really like this elevator music <laughs> a whole lot. It's good. <laughs> Yeah, as long as it's blues, blues elevated music, I can. How, did, it sounds like before the incident that you already were working with a lot of self-esteem, you know, you were going, you had a lot of confidence, you were already in a really healthy place. Um, yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I've always been confident. Um, uh, I'm, I feel very grateful. I feel very blessed for where I am and the opportunities that I've had to lead me up until this point. And I'm fully aware that I could not have done any of it by myself. You know, with the accident, one of the biggest reasons I was able to pull through the way I did was because of friends and family and the support that I received from everyone. Mm -hmm. If you're alone and something like this happens to you, I can't even imagine how difficult it would be you know, to not have a support system. So for anyone listening to, if you're going through something, it's okay to reach out to friends or family or anyone because that's what they're there for. Okay. And you need it. How has this affected your music? Were you already, you were already a musician, obviously, before it happened because you were delivering uh, music stuff. You've been working on your record. And then uh, but how did it yes. form your, maybe your songwriting or your performance or any of that stuff? But that's a good question too. Um, it made me realize that I really needed to focus on my musicianship. Like beforehand, I kind of just felt like everything was going to fall into place and it was just going to happen like some magical miracle or something. And so then a different miracle happened to me, I guess, uh, which kind of opened up my eyes to just how everything works. You know, so I really, I really started focusing on my voice. I really started focusing on the quality of the song. You know, it's funny, Darius Rucker, um, or like Hootie and the Blowfish. You know, he, uh, I ended up going to see. He was, he was my first show back after the accident. I went and saw him at the Perfect Vodka Amphitheater in West Palm. Um, 
I was pretty close to the stage and everything too, but I took a, I took a selfie or whatever and uh, posted it on my Facebook page being like, first concert, like really enjoying myself, Darius Rucker, like Go Hootie or something. And one of my, I think my father's friends grew up with him or something and ended up sending the picture of me to Darius's lawyer. And then Darius's lawyer showed Darius and then Darius sent me an email um, you know, just thanking me for coming to a show and that he heard I was a musician and just gave me some pointers on the industry. And uh, so, yeah, if anyone's listening right now, it's all about the song. Legendary bands aren't legendary bands because they're cool. They're legendary because they have legendary music. Amen After my that. accident, I really focused on the writing aspect as well. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So next musically is... Um, I've got about I've got about five or six really good songs I think right now um, that could become kind of competitive. That's another thing that I learned is like my competition would be like you know Adele and Ed Sheeran if I really wanted to be in the music world. So like you need to get up to like Adele and Ed Sheeran's level. Um, so I think I've got a couple songs now. Finally, I'll, I'll, just, I'll stop rotating so my vocals <laughs> You're fine. don't go in and out. Um, so I think I finally got some songs that might be competitive or cool that could, yeah. Would you like so, to do a song? Yeah, I'll play, um, play one called San Francisco right now. So when I was in college, you know, I've always been kind of a hopeless romantic. And uh, I was dating this girl. It was my first real, sh I'd say my first real experience with love. And it ended up crashing and burning in a fire and fury and everything and I, at the time I wanted to classic right like college love and everything um, and so I wanted to run away to San Francisco but my mom ended up being like well what about South Florida like your younger brother's down there I was like yeah I'll move to South Florida but South Florida didn't have the same ring to it as San Francisco so um I ended up still calling it San Francisco and kind of writing about like what it would have been like to uh, run away to there and leave everything behind and start over. The good news about love is that when it comes undone, it, it is great for songwriting. <laughs> oh, exactly. As is love itself. <laughs> and I just, I set myself up so many times, I can't even tell you how much material I have. <laughs> Have you ever seen the movie uh, Walk Hard? You mean my favorite movie of it's all the time? It's the best. <laughs> it's so good. So, like, I mean, I used to love, like, Walk the Line, like the Johnny Cash one. And the other day, like, I'd seen it on Netflix a million times. I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch the, the Dewey Cox story. It's I was so like, funny. why not? I've never, I, I laughed for, like, an hour and a half straight, two hours straight. I, oh, I watched so, it, like, back to back. I couldn't it's so believe funny. It. When he, she's like, don't you write a song about me, Dewey? Don't you write a song? <laughs> <It's> so good. <laughs> it's so funny. It really is. All right. All right, San Francisco. Car. And I might 
Get a job at some cool bar Take a boat out on the bay Walk across the Golden Gate Let the past be the past So I'm going to San Francisco As far away as I can get Feel the fog growing For a bomb that's in Excellent song. Uh, Nashville. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice. Very good. So good. Well, so what's the record going to be called that's coming out? We are not there yet. You're not there I yet. I wish you were. I think it's going to be about five or six song EP, though, mm-hmm. uh, when it's all said and done. And yeah, we're, I'm really excited about it. We're all really excited about it. Do you have a projection uh, date or not? Don't know yet. No. Um, currently right now, I'm still kind of, uh, I'm testing out the songs at mm-hmm. different venues, uh, shows, and open mics to kind of see um, how people respond to them. Uh, so far, really, really, really good responses, especially to San Francisco. I think that might be one of the, the crowd favorites. Yeah, it's a great song. Thank you. Exciting. Yeah. Finally, yeah. Holden, you really, this is a great conversation. You're really a fascinating guy. And I think Thank that you. people will, uh, can learn a lot by your grace and your openness and willingness to see the bright side, which is a rarity, I think, these days. It's, it's nice. It's refreshing to hear. What was that? Was that Monty Python skit? Like, always look on the bright side of life? Yes. That's Absolutely. a good one. <laughs> Monty Python is the best. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Take it easy. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcasts. Thank you. 